So I think when I look at my golf swing, you know, obviously we have traits. We have stuff that's just very hard to iron out of your swing. Um, if I look at it, for me, two things that have remained fairly constant is, well, one, my release profile. I've always been someone who works pretty hard to, to release the club. Well, I, I don't try to release the club. I'm always trying to keep the club as passive as possible, but I release it pretty hard in the swing. And that comes from years of growing up with a very open club face. I used to be very toe down at the top of my swing. And the other thing is because of that, trying to square that club face at the bottom, my head tends to stay back as well. So those are probably traits that I've had a really hard time getting rid of, but in some ways they're my talent. You know, uh, that my right hand I call my steering wheel, you know, and I think I'm, I'm very good at timing it up at the bottom and you know, that is how I play golf. I'm not a guy who's bowed and super strong and holds a face very passive. I can sort of do it on the driving range when I'm in the flow, but it's something that I've never really been able to bet into my game to take that to the golf course. Uh, at some time, at some points, that causes me trouble. But I think in other times, I you know I play with a lot of feel. Even though I look quite a, a methodical and technical player, I, I, there's quite a lot of feel still in my swing. Club phase rotating through the ball is also a way to get speed. You know, one you can have it closed at the top, but then you're not really releasing it over the top like a forehand in tennis. So I guess I learned almost to get a lot of speed by throwing the club at impact. So I would say that is probably why I developed playing with an open face is because I had to sh really create the speed through impact. And you know, you get a lot of speed, one with club head speed, but also face rotation has an element to, yeah. to how you're gonna hit it. But um, yeah, that, I'd love to iron, I'm still working on that part of my game, um, you know, when I started working with Sean Fowler, we definitely had a three-phase approach, um, you know, backswing, transition, and then through into the follow-through. And I would say I still haven't mastered the follow-through in terms of being completely in balance how I want it with club face stable and what, and what have you. But I know that basically that half of the swing is always a bit of a culmination of, of what's happened prior to and coming into impact. So, um, you know, we're always continuing to refine my game. We've had to work around injuries as well. Um, you know, Sean inherited some problems with my swing and my game and my body based upon previous technique and, and things like that. So, you know, we've always had to have a few workarounds, um, especially, I would say, from 2016 into 17 into 18. We started to look at the golf swing not so much from how we would want it technically perfect, but what was safe for me. And in some ways, we went a little bit retro. Uh, we call it sort of 1960s style. We, we have a lot more slack in my lower half, a lot more straightening of my right leg. The left, the left leg would move a lot more, you know, more kind of a la Sam Snead and, and, and you know, guys of the past, rather than the very much X factor approach where you keep the lower half still and you turn the upper body on top. I think we, we've gone away from that methodology. Um, there's a lot of methodology now that's come out, you know, out onto tour. You know, you kind of your Matt Wolfs and these guys that have these super funky backswings, but it's all about how they lay it down in transition and then can turn through very hard. So I'm trying to incorporate parts of that that approach into my game. Um, you know, I tend just to at the still even now to get the club almost too in front of me. I think there was. Um, for so long, people talked about getting the club in front of you, getting the club in front of you, but I want to feel like the club is behind me, so I then have the uh, incentive to turn my body through, and it's like a water skier. You know, when the boat's turning, eventually that water skier gets flung out, and that's the same with a golf club. You kind of want it behind you, your body's the, the boat turning to the left, and eventually that club is going to get kicked out. And that, you know, that's the, I would say, the new move in golf that, that, that people are trying to perfect. Um, at the moment, I can kind of just still get a little ahead of it, get the club dumped out a little bit. Then I'm trying to like find that space, you know, at the end um, to fit that, to fit the club into impact, I suppose. Right. Fundamentals, I think, good grip, um, alignment, set up. You know, we, he, he obviously was, he, he taught me, he read it, he read golf magazines and, and he passed what he knew on. Uh, you know, he loved the face being toe down. That's what he thought was right. So, you know, obviously I've inherited some other things from him too. But um, I would say just the way we kept it very simple. Uh, I, I would say more of the mental approach that he, he, you know, he was fantastic at how we prepared for events. I think I was way ahead of the curve in terms of how we would go about, you know, setting our, our targets, goals, um, and working into a tournament. You know, whether it be the McGregor Trophy, England under 16s, or the Karras Trophy, England under 18s, we would have a sort of a two or three month plan in place of how I would prepare. You know, even re remember getting ready for the Walker Cup. I'd never played in America, I'd never played in that amount of humidity. So I remember going up to my bathroom, turning on the shower, turning on the bathtub, trying to steam the whole thing up, wearing six levels, six layers of clothing, excuse me, and practicing my putting in there for an hour. So, you know, that was kind of my way of preparing. And so my dad always encouraged me to, to think about 
the, the mental side and the preparation side. And one thing I wish I've done a better job of, but you know, we almost had like a recall system where if I hit a great nine iron, we called it the Ratcliffe on Trent nine iron, which is where the England 16 championships was played. And I hit a great shot into the last hole to six feet. And, you know, forevermore, every time I had a nine iron, you try to conjure up those positive memories. So he was very, very good at on the mental side. Trackman's been huge in terms of the understanding of the D plane, um, the understanding of you know what the combination of swing direction and attack angle. You know that those are the two things that create the club path, the path of the sweet spot. So you know. You used to look at your divot and you think, oh, my divot's straight. Why, you know, why is the ball hooking? Well, you know, if you swing straight at the target but with a very steep angle of attack, essentially the, the sweet spot's traveling out to the right. Um, so there's that combination that, that, that science has learned to figure out. Um, you know, even when you look at some of the greats in terms of how they've gone about drawing and fading it, that's proven not to be the way that it actually works. So it's very interesting. Um, I always used, never understood why I would always hook the ball when I try to hit it low. And it's for the exact same reason, really. You know, you put the ball back in your stance and all of a sudden, you know, you're hitting down more, the sweet spot's traveling more to the right. You're putting more curve, you know, right to left spin on the ball, so. And I still do it to this day. Like, I, if I, I, I just sometimes want to get a benchmark for where my feels are. So I can be feeling like I'm swinging one way. And I, I like to, especially with the driver, I like to put it on track, man, because, I, you know, I'll hit two or three up on it and I want to know how far out to the right I can swing to create what's a fairly neutral path. Um, so I can learn, I can say, okay, well, I'm still a couple of degrees negative. I can keep swinging out to the right until we kind of find that, that zero number, just as a, as a benchmark, as a feel. So, I mean, I, I wouldn't say I'm actually that technical. People yes. often think that I am, but I would use the technology to create a feel. What can I then go and play with on the golf course? You know, but it's just giving me parameters. I don't think you can ever play perfect golf. I think great golf is how good your bad shots are. And if, if, if those parameters come in, I think, you know, a, fr a friend of mine's a beginner golfer and he said, oh yeah, I've got quite a big V in my game. You know, that's the way he described it, like ball goes this way and this way. And I, get, I said to him, I've got a V in my game too. It's probably just, a, you know, a lot tighter than yours. So I guess that's just, we're always trying to bring these parameters in in terms of what's good and what's bad. But you're right, you, a two-way miss is probably something that's very hard to play with. Um, you can't aim that way. If you have a tendency one way or another, you can always make a smart decision on the golf course knowing what your tendencies are. Um, so I guess trying to get rid of a two-way miss is the, will be the first thing you've got to try and do in your game. We had a conversation the other day and I said, you know, his intellect's caught up to his intuition, meaning that as a coach, um, you know, he's learned so much in terms of obviously the track man side, but more the biomechanics. And, you know, Sean doesn't talk to other golf teachers about the game. He goes outside of golf to try and learn more about the golf swing and the golf game, you know, more of these masters in movement and, and, and what have you, because, you know, he's not necessarily one method fits all, which I, you know, I don't think that that's good coaching. You know, you need to understand what, like I said, the tendencies of, of a player, but what they're physically capable of doing or not. Um, and, and having like workarounds yeah. uh, and knowing that this move pairs with this move and, you know, and they, they, they can go together. So you, know, you can't just put everybody on plane. If some guy is super bowed, he probably needs to rotate and turn pretty hard through the ball. So, you know, he kind of has, has, has that somewhat figured out, but he, he probably had it figured out in, you know, um, intuitively when he was a, a young coach, but now obviously his intellect is now making sense of it all. Yeah. Yeah, now knows why, but I think we're almost both of us going back on a slightly different journey where we're kind of going back to simplicity, taking away the camera, taking away trap man and just going back a little bit more to the art form of it rather than always trying to scientifically prove it. For me, like the exploration with my putting through the years has been interesting. Like the more I learned about putting, the worse putter I became um, to the point where I learned enough where I realized what didn't work and what I had to strip away and what I had to simplify. So I've always felt that Ultimately, my good golf, I, I think there's growth, pay, growth phases and performance phases. And I think it's important to go through those growth phases where you're trying to learn and, and tinker and, and get better and improve. Um, but then the performance phase is always generally stripping away and, and, and just simplifying, I suppose. It's important at the age that I'm at now that I work smartly, efficiently and make the most of it. I would say if I was to split it up, an hour in the gym, an hour putting, an hour chipping, an hour hitting balls. Um, and then about four hours mess, I don't know where the rest of the day goes. <laughs> um, but 
it's I think as a young man and as a young pro and as a young kid yeah you've got to spend as much time as you can learning and honing your game and being creative though you can't just, I, I, I would always discourage people to stand on the range for four or five hours I think that takes such a toll on your body over time um, I would encourage them to to do two or three drills that challenge them that make the skill of hitting balls harder I go hit off a sandy lie for an hour so you know your body's going to figure out what to do to make good clean contact don't just give have a perfect lie and hit for hours you know that's not really simulating what's going to happen on the golf course so we call that deep practice where you take a skill make it harder and try and do it efficiently um, and then spend time on the golf course and as a kid i think probably the thing that developed my game the most was throwing my ball in the woods and deep like 100 yards in the woods and figuring out a path through and how, you know how many shots would it take me to get it in the hole you know, up over limbs, round trees, you know, stuff like that. Um, that's where the creativity is born. I think uh, chalk lines and alignment sticks, they have their place, but I don't think that's really gonna drive on. Um, you know, that can maybe get you very, very efficient at the game. I don't think it's gonna make it great at the game.